everybody aware of because we're the body of Christ and we get to celebrate uh, things. Um, I want to welcome uh, Jeremiah and Melissa here. They have become newly engaged. For those of you who didn't know, I just want to welcome you here, folks, today. And uh, interestingly, it's uh, Melissa's parents' 25th wedding anniversary this week, so that's awesome. Amen? Amen. So, uh, congratulations to your family. It's a big, uh, it's a, it's a big season and big time for you. Uh, let's uh, stand together and let's bow in the presence of the Lord, who uh, causes us to come into a spacious, spacious place. How many of you feel like God is beginning to push our congregation? into a spacious place. God's beginning to bring us into a place of abundance. It's a place of, uh, in spite of all that's going on in the world, God is bringing us into this amazing place at the center of his heart and his love, where his power is gonna be poured out through our lives and we become channels of his blessing to flow into the world. How many of you feel that? How many of you sense that? Amen, amen. Let's just, let us, uh, Let's just uh, bow in a word of prayer and give this time to him. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. Thank you for your presence and your power. Jesus, we just bask in the radiance of your glory and your love. You are so, so good. So, so good. Somebody just begin to worship the Lord. Father God, we give you this time, we give you this hour, we give you this, uh, this moment that you might just begin to minister in and through us, even as we come in to minister to you by the, uh, this thing that we can do called worship. By your grace and by your mercy, we are established in this place. And now, now we give you glory and honor and praise. Flow through this place, Holy Spirit, with your healing touch even as we lift our hands to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. What a privilege we have to come into the presence of our God. This first song is a prayer. It's a prayer to our God asking for the one thing that we need to have power in our life, and that is love. It's time we learned how to love again, what it truly, truly means. So, Lord, I ask as we sing this song, you would open up those pathways in our lives. Yes. Teach us, Lord, yes. to love like you love, Lord God. Oh, in Jesus' name, we love you.
as prodigals are coming home again. Oh, the triumph of his name will never end. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our hearts. Oh, his name is Jesus. You're the king and you're the center of it all. Oh, we'll sing to you your name, your name.
Jesus, tell Jesus, tell Jesus, just tell Jesus. Oh, sing to Jesus, tell Jesus, speak to Jesus, love on Jesus, because he's loved on you so much. The love of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus pouring out, the love of Jesus pouring out, the love of Jesus pouring out, pour.
grave can keep you bound. All sin and sickness bound to the name of Sing the name of Jesus. Jesus. And throned upon the praises of our hearts. Oh, we sing, Jesus, you're the King and you're the center of upon the praises of our hearts. Oh, we sing your name now. Jesus, you're the King and you're the center of it all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. other. It's your love for yourself. And until you embrace the idea that you have to be taught to love again, you won't find what you're looking for. But the moment you surrender your your will to me, the moment you decide that you want me to show you how to love again, that's when your victory will come.
bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name. Bless the name of the Lord. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Your presence in this place, oh Jesus. Worship the Lord, oh bless the Lord. We worship. We bless your name. Holy is the name of the Lord. Holy is the name of the Lord. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Is the Lord. Jesus. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our lives. Holy Spirit, we thank you for applying the power of Jesus' resurrection to us today. Oh God, move by the power of your Spirit in our hearts and in our souls. Move by the power of your Spirit now across this congregation. Where there is need for healing, we pray that the ministry of healing would be put in place. Where there is need for deliverance, we pray that the deliverance of Jesus would be made manifest and known right now, right now, right now. By the authority and grace of our God, we claim it and release it over ourselves this morning and further into our community, Lord God. Today, we release the spirit of evangelism that is rising in this place into our community. And I thank you for the souls that are becoming your witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit that is rising up within us. Lord, by the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are claiming a rebirth of the strength of our witness in this region, in this land. And we are seeing it with our eyes beginning to take place. And we bless the name of our Lord Jesus who is making it possible. Lord God, we thank you for the connection you are building between us as a body of Christ. We thank you, Lord God, that our eyes are being opened to each other and we are beginning to see each other, some of us for the first time and know each other, some of us for the first time and our relationships are deepening because of the love of Jesus which is pouring forth from the throne of God into our lives and we thank you and we bless you for that, Lord God and we thank you that you are not done yet because out of the overflow, out of the increase that you are bringing in into this house there will be an overflow and an abundance of witness that will begin to transform and change our land Lord God we thank you for the work that you are raising up in churches brothers and sister churches throughout this region and we thank you that their witness is increasing we thank you for the work of the worship room and we thank you that the principalities and powers that have long held sway in this region are being put on notice and are being bound and they are losing their strength because of the power of Jesus Christ and the hope and love of Jesus Christ which is being released even this day in this place and in churches all across our region. Bless the name of Jesus who is seen fit to make this our day, our time that the throne of God may be established through the people of God in this place for a revival of righteousness for a revival of holiness for a revival of grace for a revival of love and for a revival of abundance and prosperity that many of us have not seen in our generation but we know that we know that we know that it is coming bless the name of Jesus bless the name of Jesus church bless the name of Jesus today hallelujah we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. And we come just to, just to ride that wave, Lord God. Just to allow ourselves to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus, which it was your will and your desire. For you foreknew us, and you predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We receive that truth and that promise today. 
Some of us in this room don't know how that's ever going to happen. But it's not our job to know how. It's just our job to accept and believe. And so this morning, we declare by faith that that promise shall be so and is becoming so even now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's children said, amen and amen. Wow. The presence of God is good. He is good, he is good, he is good. Thank you, worship team. It's good, uh, and thank you, congregation, for worshiping with us today. So good, so good. I want to welcome uh, John and Angela Bover, who I see are here with us today from the worship room. Nice to have you with us, John and Angela visiting. And uh, all this summer, we have been giving ourselves... Uh, I should probably change into my other microphone, right? Hold on, I gotta change. Am I on? Yeah, I am. What do you know? Bless God. I'm just going to walk around with this thing a little bit. And uh, boy, this has been a... I'm so excited about what God is doing in our region. How many of you are excited with me? Amen. I'm believing that God is getting ready to do this amazing thing uh, in, in this region that many of us uh, began to pray into existence back in, oh, I don't know, 1979, 1981. I was, like a, I, I was like a little more than a twinkle at that point. I was like a small, small star. <laughs> um, but I Hello? There I am. I shut myself off. Um, it's the microphone version of a butt dial. But uh, I, I know that from the beginning, uh, you know, Uncle Tom and uh, so many of you others, Barbara Strom and Bob Strom, Wendy and Grace, have been praying for a move of God in our region, and we are about to see it. I believe that with all my heart. How about you? Amen. Amen. Uh, many of you were in other churches praying for this very same thing back in 1979, 1981, and, and the move of God has just extended throughout this region. He's been building up to this, almost like this, um, uh, this critical mass, and I feel like we're there, and we just have to be faithful to ride the wave and to see it through, amen? All this summer, we've been doing things that are uh, fostering doing life together. We've been praying uh, for several of our students who are going off. Uh, we prayed for Jeremiah a few weeks ago. We'll be praying for Melissa. She gets ready to do her boards uh, shortly, her nursing boards. And today, we're praying for Brother Chuck Zerley. Uh, so, if, Brother Chuck, if you want to come on up. Uh, Brother Chuck is a minister with the uh, Southern New England uh, Ministry Network, and uh, he and his wife, Patty, have been here with us for the last several months. Everyone give them a hand. And I asked uh, Pastor Chuck if he would be willing to let us pray for him because uh, tomorrow, is that right? Is it tomorrow or Tuesday? Tomorrow he is going for his uh, boards to become a, a counselor, a certified mental health counselor, correct? And licensed uh, counselor in our region. And so... Uh, isn't it amazing what God is bringing into our midst, right? Uh, and so we're going to stand together as a body, and we're just going to pray over him. I'm going to have Jerry come forward and lay hands, if that's okay. And uh, we're just going to pray. And if you'd extend a hand of grace and faith uh, towards our brother and sister. And uh, thank you. Go ahead, Patty, lay your hand on, on his back. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church, begin to praise God for the provision and for the, uh, for the pieces of the puzzle that are coming together here at Cornerstone at this season, at this time. We thank you for sending Pastor Chuck and Sister Patty here for this season, for this time uh, of our work together. Lord, whatever they have to do here among us, we now release that impartation. We release that anointing into their lives. Lord, they have been faithful. They have walked so many years. They have done so many things throughout their ministry, Lord God. And now is a new season, a season where you are beginning to call and bring a new anointing, a fresh anointing, an empowering anointing. There's a turn of the corner. There's an opening of a door. There's the fresh breeze of the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing into their lives. I sense it and I thank you for it. And I pray, Lord God, that uh, everything that you desire for their lives for this season, this time, would begin to manifest. As a body of Christ here at Cornerstone, we bind around them in faith, believing prosperity and abundance. As we lay hands on, we pray, Lord God, that his mind would be quickened tomorrow as he takes this test and the pathway would be opened, Lord God, as he goes to uh, get certified, Lord God. We pray that that certification would come and it would open doors and open windows and open pathways, Lord God, that would lead him exactly where he needs to be, where he needs to go, and that he would be uh, in this place, in this body, that his gifts and anointings, that Sister Pat these gifts and anointings would be open to us and flow freely, Lord God, like a river, like a power, like, an, like, like a mighty conflagration through this region, through this land, that the revival that we call for, that their part in it would be carried out and, and brought forth. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless you, brother. And uh, there, is, there is more to come. Uh, we have a lot of people to pray over. Uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And that doesn't include the people who we are praying for and believing for uh, healings for. If you're in this room and you've been seeking a healing from God, would you just stand right now? I know that there are people who are, who are, receiving, who are seeking healings from Jesus Christ, and uh, we are praying. There are even more people here than, uh, than before. Uh, if you would make sure that you send those prayer requests, we're praying every Wednesday night during our prayer time that God would release the spirit of healing. And in a couple of weeks' time, next week we're preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then the uh, week after that we're preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit again, and uh, then we are going to be speaking, uh, uh, in a few weeks' time beyond that, we'll be speaking about sanctification and then healing. And we're believing God. I am praying and fasting and seeking God that a mighty move of healing would be upon us. Let's just uh, extend a hand of faith towards those who are standing in this room. Lord God, right now, we release the power of healing in this congregation. Lord, it is nothing of us. We are just conduits. We are just channels through which your blessing can flow. And as our friends, as our brothers and sisters stand here today, we flow the ministry of the Holy Spirit of healing into their lives. We claim their healing. We claim their healing. We claim their healings. And together as a congregation, we believe that our God is more than able because our God is an all powerful God, and with him nothing shall be impossible. Declare it, church. With God, nothing shall be impossible. Declare it again. With God, nothing shall be impossible. One more time. With God, nothing shall be impossible. Lord God, our words ascend to heaven. May your throne be moved, and may the power be released even today in those who are standing for themselves and in those who are standing for their families. May that power be released today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Give God a hand of blessing today. I have on my notes that I'm supposed to make one more announcement. I pray that's the only thing. Uh, my staff tries to keep me organized, and those of you who have worked with me know how hard that is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I'm like a whole herd of chickens. And, uh, but I have an announcement here. Today begins deacon nominations. Now, we went over the qualifications for a deacon uh, last week, and those are in paper form, correct, Carrie? Yeah. Amen. That's good. Uh, those are in paper form out on the tables in the lobby if you need to see the qualifications. But as I said last week, I'd asked you to begin praying 
for deacons, the, 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 pe the people that God is putting the anointing of deacon on. I ask you to begin praying for that uh, over the next two weeks, this Sunday and next Sunday. So it's really only seven days, but we'll say it's two weeks. You have an opportunity to nominate somebody for deacon, and you can see the qualifications out there if you have questions, and then we, the board will begin meeting to vet those qualifications. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's take one more time just to pray and ask Jesus uh, to lead and guide our leadership. Father God, <laughs> we've prayed over many things today, and you are a good God, for you answer us. And we know that you already know who uh, the deacons are. You've already chosen them, even though we have uh, months, literally months to go before we draw the lots for those deacons. And so we pray, Lord God, that now you would lead, guide, and direct the choosing, the nomination process, and we pray that you would put in uh, to, uh, before our sight, before our understanding, those who are to be part of the process of uh, the drawing of lots. And we pray, Lord God, that you would lead, guide, and direct that whole process from beginning to end. We pray for our congregation. We pray for our uh, nominations committee, our, our deacon, deacon board that will be vetting those nominations. We pray that you would uh, lead us, guide us, and direct us that unity and power may be released through this time of choosing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So today, uh, we're going to be speaking just for the next few minutes um, in regards to the next message in our series called Foundations. We've been in this series for uh, six weeks now, uh, which with interruptions has probably been more like eight or nine weeks. Um, but we're continuing on with the teaching, and today uh, we are continuing to cover one by one the foundational truths uh, that the Bible teaches us to believe. There are 16 of them that, that, we, uh, that I thought were important for us to grab hold of, and today we are on foundation number six. The 16 fundamentals, just by way of rehearsal, and again, those of you who have been in classes with me know that I love rehearsing what we've already said. You know why? Because repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is the key to learning. What's the key to learning? So the more we say it, the more chances there are that you'll hear it at least once. I was a youth pastor for a long time, and I always knew that um, if I was going to get anybody to go to our annual youth convention, I had to start announcing it like eight months in advance. So, you know, it was, they had them every year. So I would wait about four months, and then on month four, so give it, it usually about July or August, I would say, hey, we're going to have youth convention in April of next year. Start saving for it. And then every week I would say, hey, we're going to have youth convention in April of next year. Start saying for it. And I would do that over and over and over and over again. And every single year we'd get to March and I'd say, hey, youth convention is coming up. Your first payment is due next week. This is probably February, actually. So in February, I'd say, hey, your, your youth convention is coming up. Your first payment is due next week. And somebody would say, there's a youth convention? Why didn't you tell me? And so my hope is that as we work through these, well, I'm going to say these 16 fundamental truths 16 times. My goal is that you will remember at least four of them. Can, who can do that? Who, who thinks they can do 16? Well, we'll start at four. Who thinks they can do four? Who thinks they can do five? Who thinks they, some, half of you just already gave up. <laughs> who thinks you can do six? There's only two hands. There's only two hands up right now. Who thinks you can do seven? Who thinks you can do eight? All right. So the winner is Sister Patty over there. And um, she probably had to memorize them at some point. So. <laughs> eight. But that's the goal. Let's see how many we can do. We're gonna, we've talked about the scriptures are inspired. They are the infallible authoritative rule of faith and doctrine. There is one true God is the second foundation. We serve one God who expresses himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
We talked about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus is God. We've talked about the fall of man and the salvation of man. Today we're talking about the ordinances of the church. Next week we're going to begin talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the week after that we'll be talking about the initial physical evidence of the baptism and the Holy Spirit being speaking in tongues. We're going to talk about sanctification. We're going to talk about the church and its mission. Brother uh, Nick Vitato is coming to preach on the 15th of August, the ministry of the church. We're going to speak the blessed hope. We're going to talk about divine healing. We're going to talk about the millennial reign of Christ, the final judgment, and the new heaven, and the new earth. And when we're finished with that, everybody will know everything there is to know about God, right? Not even remotely. This is an introduction, and what we're doing on Sunday mornings is we're just giving a really brief overview of the foundational truth. And then during my Digging Deeper devotions, we go a little bit deeper uh, into the, the doctrine uh, that we're teaching. And so Monday through Saturday, there's another little devotion that we do. It's about 10 or 15 minutes every day. And in that devotion, we go a little bit deeper into whatever we're talking about. And we'll do that again this week. So today we're launching into fundamental truth number six, which the official title of that foundation is The Ordinances of the Church. Everybody already knows, right? I love words. Don't you? This week we talked about redemption. I said, what's redemption? We talked about sanctification. I said, what's sanctification? And when we defined it. Because, you know, we throw words like this around in the church, you know, I'm saved. Yeah, what's that mean? What are you saved from? Was there a flood? You know, because a lot of flooding going on. Were you saved from the flood? No. Salvation. Today we're talking about ordinances. What's an ordinance? Well, it's an authoritative decree or direction. The church, our church, practices two ordinances, communion and baptism. They were instituted by Jesus. Who gave the ordinance? Who gave the authoritative decree or direction? Jesus did. Um, he told them that they were to be practices, in, told us, that they were to be practices in every Christian's life. Everyone say, every Christian's life. How many of you are Christians? Are you? Good. That's awesome. I can go home. All Christians, if you call yourself a Christian, then these are commands that the Lord said you should have practiced at least once in your life. So let's talk about these two ordinances, baptism and communion. Let's start with baptism. The ordinance of baptism by immersion is commanded in the scriptures. Everyone who repents and believes on Christ as Savior and Lord is to be baptized. Thus, they declare to the world that they have died with Christ and that they also have been raised with him to walk in newness of life. So, what did, how did Jesus command us to be baptized? Well, first of all, Jesus himself was baptized. Jesus said this, uh, actually this was a conversation between him and John the Baptist uh, in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 3. It goes like this. John said, I baptize you with water for repentance. He was talking to a crowd. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. How many of you would like to be baptized with fire? Kind of like, kind of like Isaiah, right? That story of Isaiah that we told a couple weeks ago. Baptized with fire. His winnowing, it's, it's, it's rough, right? It burns a little at the beginning, but once you're purified, it's, it's good, you're good to go. I digress. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness." Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighted on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So a couple of things I want to just point out from this passage of Scripture. First of all, did Jesus need to be baptized? Did he need to be baptized in order to have his sin cleansed away? No. 
Baptism doesn't cleanse away sin. It didn't, Jesus had no sin to cleanse, and baptism will not cleanse away your sin, right? We'll get into that a little bit more later. But Jesus didn't get baptized because he needed to say, I, I've died to sin. He needed to be baptized to identify with the body of Christ and to say, I'm starting something, right? The Bible says that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. He is the one who goes forward and he establishes the pattern for everyone else how we are to live and be. Jesus started his ministry by getting baptized. If Jesus needed to be baptized, how many of you think we might need to be baptized as well? So we need to be baptized because Jesus was baptized, but also because Jesus commanded us to be baptized. In Matthew chapter 28, as Jesus is talking with his disciples for one of the last times, he says to his disciples... He says, go and make disciples of all nations, just like I've made you disciples, Jesus says. Go and do the same thing to them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus commanded his disciples to make disciples by baptizing. Powerful truth. In Mark chapter 16, 16, Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I want to stop here for a minute because people get a little confused. They think that because of this verse, that if you're not baptized, you're not saved. That's not what Jesus said. In John 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, we talked, to him, we talked about that last week. How many remember that? The salvation of man, right? We were talking about the salvation of man last week. And Jesus has this conversation in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus um, about going to heaven. And Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. How many of you remember that now? So Jesus said, to be born again, you have to have an experience uh, with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has to bring you to life. So a man is born once. Everyone, how many of you here have been born? Right? Everyone's been born. I mean, it's, we didn't even have to think about it. We didn't, we didn't do nothing for that. We just got born. Same thing the second time. Jesus says you must be born again. Man has to be born naturally. In order to be a human, you must be born naturally. If, you, if any of you have not been born, talk to me later. <laughs> but every one of us had one birth. But Jesus said you have to choose the second birth. You must be born again. You must allow the Spirit to bring your, you to life, to eternal life, Right? And then he says in John 3.16, that famous verse that every one of us have memorized, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus there sets the condition for salvation as faith. He says you must believe. Here in Mark 16, he says it as well. He says, in, he says John, uh, John 3.16 says, all who believe will not perish but have everlasting life. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. That's John 3, 17. John, uh, Jesus says that in Mark 16, 16 as well when he says, whoever does not believe is not condemned. Baptism is not a condition of salvation. In other words, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. But if you are saved in obedience to Christ, you will be baptized. It's the first thing you can really obey God in right? Your new life of obedience. You say, Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior. And then the Lord says, okay, be baptized. And you say, but my hair. I don't like to get wet, right? But Jesus says, be baptized. What baptism symbolizes? In Romans 6, uh, verse 4, and we'll be going into this during our Digging Deeper uh, devotions this week, says, um, Paul says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism symbolizes that, symbolizes that we have experienced uh, our sins have been washed away and we've been brought to a new life. When you get immersed, you, you're brought to a new life. It's a symbol of what's already happened. Our church practices ordinances, not sacraments. Those of you who have a Catholic background know that there are seven sacraments. In other words, seven things that you can do to make yourself holy, right? That's a, what a sacrament is. A sacrament is when you do it, it makes it, the act itself makes you holy. Baptism cannot make you holy. If you aren't already holy when you get baptized, you won't be holy 
when you come up out of the water. All you'll be is wet. <laughs> right? Baptism doesn't make us holy. We do it because we have been made holy and we want to tell everybody else. That's the difference between an ordinance and a sacrament. Sacraments are believed to, they are acts by which you think you are being made holy. But no act can make us holy. Paul the Apostle teaches us that in Ephesians chapter 2, which we talked about last week. It is not by works of righteousness that you have done, but according to his mercy he has saved you. So baptism can't save you, right? Baptism doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. That's a Keith Green switch there, right? But what baptism does is it speaks to the world and says, it tells, tells the world what's happened inside your heart. Something inside me has changed. Something's not the same. I'm changed. So I'm getting baptized to tell the world. Ordinances and sacraments declare participation. When you get baptized, you are saying to yourself in the world, I'm following Jesus now. It's a declaration. It doesn't make you holy. You've already been made holy by your faith. Somebody say amen to that. That's amen. good. That's good teaching. Now listen, I believe in immersion. When I baptize people, I like them to get seriously wet. Right? I want all of them under the water. We practice immersion baptism. But can a person be baptized um, without getting immersed? Sure. We've done it several times here. We've had people, in fact, there are people in the congregation here who have relatives um, who could not get up the stairs into the baptismal or could not uh, get in and out of the baptismal with ease. And so if you remember, we had a little blue kiddie pool here that we set up for several congregants, and we helped them into the kiddie pool. And then as staff, we all stood around with these little purple and pink and yellow buckets, and we just like thoroughly doused them, <laughs> right? Um, I'm, not a big, I'm not a big sprinkle person. I like people to get wet. But, so, uh, it's, not, it's, it's about your heart. It's not about the method. To that, I want to say this. We have a baptism. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you have not yet been baptized, we will be doing a baptism on Sunday. Oh, I'm glad they changed that date there because it's not changed in my notes. Good job, staff. Whoever did that. Sunday, August 22nd, we are having a baptism. And the Wednesday night before will be a baptism class. So if you would like to be baptized, there are sign-ups out in the foyer. Um, and you can sign up there and we'll get back to you with the time of the class. Moving on from baptism uh, to Holy Communion. We call it, it has several names, communion. We call it the Lord's Supper. It consists of what we call the elements. Everyone say elements. That's not like carbon or oxygen or anything like that. The elements are the bread and the fruit of the vine. Um, it's the symbol expressing our sharing the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ, a memorial of his suffering and death, and a prophecy of his second coming, and it's enjoined or commanded on all believers till he come. We're supposed to practice communion together. That's something that the body does. We practice baptism so we're going to have baptisms here on a regular basis. All the time we'll be baptizing people. And so that means you folks have to go get people. You go have to witness to people and bring them to church and get them, get them to confess Jesus as Lord. You need the Holy Spirit's help for that, right? You can't force people to accept Jesus. How many of you would like to, as a member of your family, you'd really like to accept Jesus? And you'd like to force them to accept Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit's help. You can't save anybody. But the Holy Spirit will help us, I believe, and I believe we're about to see God um, move on people's hearts, and we're going to have people to baptize. How many of you believe that? Amen. Amen. So communion is something we do. I love communion. I absolutely love communion. It's such a deep and important ceremony um, and, and ordinance of the church. Jesus created baptism. Uh, sorry. And he, also, he didn't create baptism. He created communion. Matthew 26 26 through 29, tells the story of the Last Supper. Now, Jesus was at a, a traditional Jewish festival, their most sacred festival of the year, and um, it was the festival of Passover, and, th and that has a rich uh, tradition 
uh, that the Jews practice, and they practice it to this day every year. And so they have a supper uh, on the night of the feast, and they have lamb, and it's a roasted lamb, and they, and they eat it with bitter herbs, and there's a whole story that goes along with it. So as Jesus, is getting, as Jesus comes to that last supper right before his crucifixion, he is having Passover with his disciples. And there's a, there is a meticulous tradition that goes along with Passover. And so he's following that as the host of the feast. He's following that tradition. And John Mark, who would have been the youngest disciple there, is actually at, the youngest person at the feast is supposed to ask the oldest, the host of the feast, tell me the story of the Passover. And so there would have been a whole telling of the story. And Jesus at that last supper would have gone through the whole story of the Israelites in Egypt on that last night. And Jesus would have just told that story. And then there's a regular tradition on how you go through to the end of the meal. And at that point, Jesus changes things up. While they were eating, the Bible says, Jesus took bread. This was not what, how it was supposed to happen. Jesus is taking an aside here. He's stepping out of tradition. And he's saying, we're about to do something new. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And you can see the look of confusion on each of the disciples. What? What now? What's going on? This isn't how it's supposed to go. And Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body. Right? Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth. I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus created communion for the church. The Jews had Passover. The church has communion. And our communion that we take every month is just as important and symbolic to us as Passover was to the Jews, or it should be. And we have the awesome privilege of restoring the sacredness of this uh, symbol of our faith. Some people say, because of the next passage that we're going to say that, if you're not right with God, if you've got sin in your life, you should not take communion, right? And we've all heard that. Those of us who have been in the church for more than a hot minute have heard, you know, when you come together, make sure you examine yourself. And if you have unconfessed sin, don't you take that cup or eat that bread, because if you do, you will die. I'm old enough in the Lord to have heard that preached a couple of times, right? Can I just say that's, that, that defies and denies the heart of communion? Communion is not about keeping people out. It's about giving people an opportunity to come in. And so, yeah, we are supposed to examine ourselves. I think a healthy examination of our lives on a constant basis is a good thing. Because I don't know about y'all, but I tend to screw up and pass it over sometimes. How many of you do that? You do things that you're like not exactly proud of and you know God is not proud of, but then life is life and you go on and you say, all right, God, we'll talk about that later. And how many of you know later never comes? And communion's that opportunity to get serious with God and say, all right, God. And that's why we have it so often. That's why we should have it so often because it's an opportunity to get right with Jesus. Every time we take communion, we remember what Jesus did for us and we have an opportunity to say, thank you, I need you to cleanse me. And so I believe when we take communion, it ought to be a time when we can come before the Lord and just allow His mercy and grace to become fresh and new in our lives every single month. It's symbolic again. Um, we don't believe in transubstantiation. Those of you who have a Catholic background will have heard of transubstantiation. And this is the idea that when um, I, I pray over the elements, they become Jesus, right? We don't practice that. Um, bread is bread. It's not Jesus. It's symbolic, right? The, the juice does not become the blood of Christ. There is a, there's a, 
a vein of, of Christianity that does believe that, and that's part of being sacred. I just want to say up front, you, you're not, it's not the body or the blood, it's a symbol. The whole thing is symbolic, and it's symbolic of something that has happened inside of our hearts. Again, we're practicing ordinances, not sacraments. Communion cannot make you holy. Faith makes you holy. And so when you, if, if you don't approach communion with faith and you don't co approach communion in relationship, all you're doing is eating a tiny little piece of bread and drinking a little tiny cup of juice. If that's your goal, go out and buy some Swiss rolls and get a great big cup of Kool-Aid because it'll satisfy you more than that little piece of bread will. It's not, about, it's not about the elements. It's about what the elements mean to us. I want to share a story um, really quickly about a pastor who had to sort of take a sidestep from tradition in order to make communion happen for his people. He writes this. It was as, as a week of summer church camp was drawing to a close. How many of you have ever been to summer family camp? Great times. It was drawing to a close, and I found myself with a group of counselors and campers enjoying mountain pies around a campfire. If you've never had a mountain pie, they are made by toasting two slices of bread and filling, and filling your choice of fruit filling, in a pie iron, creating a small pastry-like treat. The night before everyone returned home was often the high point of the week, a time to share stories, laugh, cry, and to celebrate communion. After we had finished singing camp songs and had all eaten our fill, I went to the cooler to get the communion supplies, but they weren't there. I found a cup, a plate, and a cloth, but no bread or juice. Looking around, I found at the edge of the woods a punctured juice container and a piece of shredded plastic wrap that had held the communion bread. It seems that a nighttime visitor with a mask and a striped tail decided to have communion on his own. No problem, I thought. We've got backup supplies. But when I returned to the campfire, I discovered to my dismay that the entire loaf of backup bread had been used to make mountain pies. After I announced our predicament to the group, one resourceful camper pointed out that there was one mountain pie that hadn't been eaten. It hadn't been eaten because it had been left in the fire too long and was burned almost beyond recognition. Nonetheless, we salvaged what we could, asked God's forgiveness, and celebrated communion that night by passing around a gallon jug of orange drink and some blackened bits of crust. I usually at least try to make the juice red. <laughs> but the point isn't what we're using for bread or what we're using for juice. The point is what it symbolizes. That's the point with the ordinances. Brothers and sisters, we have this incredible inheritance that has been given to us. And Jesus did not want us to forget the inheritance and the promise that he made. So he created within his church these, these rituals, if you will, or these um, activities that constantly call us back to our center. Because the world, the flesh, and the devil are working overtime to constantly draw our attention away from the promises that we have, and the world tries to make these things unimportant. But God Jesus has created these things so that we can come together as a body of Christ and recognize that we share in an incredible inheritance. God at this season of the church is calling our church back to that inheritance 
So many of us have forgotten that we get to walk in that inheritance now. Perhaps not all of it. Perhaps we don't have immortal bodies yet. We will have those immortal bodies one day, but we do have power now. We're looking around at the world, and as brothers and sisters, can I just tell you, we should not be afraid of what is happening in the world. But so many of us are falling victim to that temptation because we have forgotten the promises that Jesus Christ Christ has made to us. People get sick in our lives and we say, oh no, what are we going to do now? And Jesus is up there in heaven interceding for us and saying, pray for them, anoint them with oil and let the power of the Holy Spirit that is inside of you begin to flow out. It is time for the church to operate in its supernatural power again. It is time for the church to realize that we have been baptized with the Holy Spirit for a reason and it is time for us as brothers and sisters to begin calling each other back to the center of our faith. Can I encourage you, when you take communion, don't just look at it as something we have to rush through and get through in order to do our due diligence and check off a box. Understand that the symbols that are encased in baptism and communion are for you. I'm not a better healer than you are. I'm not a more powerful Christian than you are. And the revival that's going to happen in this region is not going to happen because of me. It's going to happen because of us. And when the body of Christ begins to recognize that, there is no stopping us. The principalities and powers in this region, they have held sway for too long. And they have been given too much credit. Oh, they are powerful. But they are not more powerful than the body of Christ. Amen. Upon this rock, I will build my church, Jesus said. Upon the confession of our faith, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Church, it's time for us to use these ordinances as weapons to call ourselves back to the center and to realize just how powerful we really are. Not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ who dwells inside of us. It's not by my might, it's not by my power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And this is what the ordinances stand for. It's not just bread and juice. It's not just a nice little ceremony that we do at the end of a service. It's a reminder of who he is and who we are. And it's time we remembered that. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to close this service like we've been closing all the foundation services by saying the Apostles' Creed to each other and confessing it over our lives, and then I'm going to pray for you and pray a blessing upon you. And so let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Church, the Holy Spirit, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters, the servants, the co-laborers in this field, the, uh, my co-heirs, Lord God, with you, Lord Jesus, of all the great inheritance in the saints. 
Father, I pray that you would help us to begin to remember your promises and who and what we are because of the work that you have done and are doing inside of our lives and because you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus be revealed. We give you glory and honor and praise today, and we pray that your promises would take us from this place, resonate in our minds all week, and help us to operate in a level of Holy Spirit love and power that we've not experienced before. In Jesus' name we're asking it, amen and amen. Go into the harvest field, and let's see what God will do this week, amen? Amen. God bless.